Hi, I'm David Giblin. I'm the Collections Manager of the Herbarium here at the Bird Museum, and I'll be your guide for today's virtual tour. I want to start with a land acknowledgement, which is how we start all meetings here at the Bird Museum. The Burke Museum stands on the lands of the Coast Salish people, whose ancestors have resided here since time immemorial. Many indigenous peoples thrive in this place, alive and strong. I want to start the tour with a segment with Executive Director Julie Stein and Building Architect Tom Kundig, and together they provide a conceptual context for the building's design and function. It is a natural history museum, and natural history is about understanding how the nature of nature works. I'm Tom Kundig. I was the principal designer on the Burke Natural History Museum. The Burke Museum is the oldest museum in Washington. It was started in 1883. We now have 16 million objects and specimens and pieces that are from biology to fossils and our culture, especially objects of Northwest Coast native art and archeology. span Julie Stein had an agenda for the museum that I just thought was um, on all levels uh, spot on. I definitely wanted it to be visible by the public and open to the community. We wanted to take it from the corner where it was hidden behind bushes and move it as close to the community angle. If in fact a new building were to emerge out of the Burke, if you were able to sort of open up that whole quadrant in a landlocked university like the University of Washington, you would now have a new quad. The true goal of this building was to provide people access to what they couldn't see in the old building. I said, I'm imagining that uh, there'll be windows and that it will just be transparent. And I had no idea how to do that. And the word transparency became one of the powerful words in this project. I could tell she wanted to evolve the nature of these museums. Well, that means you're risk-taking because you don't have examples out there. This is a museum that's all about transparency and all about clarity. It's about the soul of a building. Well, as soon as she said something about looking through a building, immediately that raised all sorts of issues of transparency and uh, porosity. Sometimes I refer to it as the Swiss cheese kind of analogy, where there's a bunch of holes in different places. Now those holes are somewhat strategically located to be transparent, but it's also supposed to be protective. All of us that have experienced more traditional museums know that there was a certain sense of almost disinviting. You almost felt intimidated. The Burke is intended to be exactly opposite of that. It's in intended to invite, to be accommodating so that you can go in and you make your own path in a sense and you can assemble your own experience rather than being sort of directed into a certain experience. I said to Tom, is there any way that we can make this museum a place filled with light and a place where you always know where you are? And it, he is, solved that problem with this glorious central stairway. He put skylights on the top that just fill the central part of the museum with this light and every floor, there is a window in the north and a window in the south. And it was a, it was a brilliant solution, and it's beautiful. The spine is the main sort of circulation, and you can see everything as you go up and everything as you go down. So you're never lost, you're never confused. You're actually focusing on what you're supposed to be looking at, which are the exhibits. People would come in, they'd see how the researchers work. They'd see how the curators work. One collections manager, after he spent a day or two, he said, I can't believe the public is interested in what I'm doing. I thought it was boring. The public has been overwhelmingly gleeful about watching people work. Children 
love to watch the bioprep lab where they are really, you know, taking apart an animal and the parents are begging their children to leave the window. We have to go home. Well, this opens up the cafe directly to that future courtyard, that future garden courtyard. And it also becomes a canopy in a sense for additional seating. It goes back to using our heads like our ancestors used rather than our motors and our machines. It's the architecture and the placement of the galleries and the workspaces and the collections um, that makes the magic happen. As an architect, it's not really about the building. It's about how it shapes the space and what people are doing in the space. That's the most fascinating thing. It's like an observer. And I just love watching the kids get all worked up about, you know, the dinosaurs and stuff. And then older people like myself that actually are really so super like focused and fascinated about an artifact and the history of that artifact and just making those connections. That's my favorite thing in the museum, is watching the people. If this museum works, it works as a public place of excitement and curiosity. And I hope that just continues in the future at the Burke. I'm now in the Contemporary Culture exhibit space, and I'm joined by Polly Olson, who's the museum's tribal liaison. And Polly's gonna tell us about the work that she does here in the museum, specifically as it relates to decolonization. Hello, I am Polly Olson. I am a member of Yakima Nation, located in South Central Washington State. I serve as the tribal liaison for the Burke Museum. And in my role as the tribal liaison, I work to build relationships, to provide access to collections and science between tribal communities and the Burke Museum researchers, curators, students, and staff. A big part of my job is to have, engage in discussions around decolonization. That's a very big word and it is a very big process. Uh, decolonization really is about having um, honest, authentic conversations about the traumas museum, the historic trauma, colonial traumas that museum hold between the stakeholders whose collections are, reside in a museum and the communities and how we can have access. The process is about how collections came, how they're being cared for, how we can use them to reclaim our culture how to enhance our science priorities within tribal communities, as well as building understanding that all ways of knowing and practicing science is valid. An important part of my job is to administer our Native American Advisory Board. We have tribal leaders, cultural heritage specialists, and others that serve on our board that provide guidance and help us decide where we want to make changes within the museum. Our members come from around the state of Washington and they volunteer their time and they serve as strong cultural advisors as well as assisting us in setting policies and, and creating a new relationship with our researchers and our visitors through our decolonizing methods. I'm very honored to serve in that role and to provide an authentic and real space for conversations to really have um, healing and opportunities to develop new projects and new research opportunities within our tribal communities. I look forward to speaking to you later and thank you for joining us um, on our tour. We'll begin the tour in the museum's ground floor lobby, which has to my left a mastodon skeleton, to my right classrooms that are used for undergraduate instruction and other educational opportunities, and suspended above me is a skeleton of bears deep wet. And to learn more about that, we have Curator of Mammals Charlene Santana and Collections Manager Jeff Bradley. So this is one of the very few bears speak whale that are on display uh, around the world. So it's a very unique specimen to have on display here at the Burke Museum. These whales are deep divers, so they're rarely encountered as strandings as we did 
So the ancestors of whales, of course, they walked on land. They were hoofed animals. So it's a really cool reminder of where these animals come from in an evolutionary sense. When visitors come and look at the bones, I hope there are lots of questions as to what are those bones and why do they have them? And that can become a really great moment to teach people about evolution and diversity of mammals. They're fast, powerful predators down at enormous depths using biosonar to catch animals who are trying really hard not to get caught. And so we wanted the posture of the whale to reflect that activity. And this pose right here, I really think, just kind of shows that, gives you a sense of what's going on down there when she's hunting. I'm now at the museum's main entrance. To my right is the general meeting room for large groups. In front of me is the museum's cafe off the beds. Behind me is the admissions kiosk and further back would be the museum store. And then to my far left is the contemporary culture exhibit galleries and collection spaces. Welcome to the contemporary culture collections. These collections reflect living and dynamic cultures. The majority of the pieces housed here come from the Americas, Oceania, and Asia. These collections are part of the Burke Museum Culture Department and include more than 51,000 pieces. These pieces are master teachers for the apprentices that come to learn from them. Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists, scholars, and community members visit and research the cultural collections housed here. The collection storage area has specialized systems for a variety of material types including rolled textiles, shelving for bent wood boxes, racks for spears, and drawers for small pieces. Relationships maintained between communities and the Burke Museum preserve the ingenuity, creativity, science, and complex knowledge of these cultural resources. Community members are the experts in these areas and we are the caretakers. I'm now on the second floor of the museum in the biology collections and exhibit space. To my left is the biology collections prep room where visitors can see the museum staff and curators doing the work of the museum. As I go down the hallway here, I'm going to pass the biology collections imaging lab. And classroom space. The museum has three permanent exhibits in the biology exhibit gallery, tree of life, ecosystems, and adaptations. Today I'm joined by herbarium curator Hick Olmsted, who's going to explain the tree of life exhibit. Darwin used the metaphor of the tree of life to describe the relationship of living things all descending from a common ancestor. Today we call that the phylogeny of life. In this exhibit, we depict that phylogeny of life in a circular cladogram, uh, starting with the root here, showing the unicellular organisms uh, that are commonly known as bacteria uh, and prokaryotes. But most of the rest of the exhibit, as we move around, shows specimens that are part of the collection here at the Burke Museum, from fungi to invertebrates, and into the vertebrates as we move further around the, collection, the exhibit. Preserve specimens from the fish collection, uh, herpetology, mammalogy, and even yourself as part of the exhibit at the point where humans emerge at the edge of the exhibit. Thus, no specimen, no species has primacy throughout the exhibit in a circular playground. Thanks, Dick. Let's now go into the bio collection space and take a look at some of the workspaces there. All right, so we're in the biology collection storage area. Cabinets are on compactors. Some places it's only one cabinet high, in other areas they're too high. But perhaps most dramatically is the way that the so many specimens are on display on the wall, on top of the cabinets. And for visitors, this is really a great experience. They can look through the glass and see so much more of the collections than they were able to in the old museum. Let's go further down and look at some of the specialty labs that form part of this workspace. 
This is the imaging lab where we do 2D and 3D imaging. This is the bio workroom uh, where visitors can see from the galleries into the workspace. All kinds of activities happen here. We try to activate this lab on a regular basis. We put up these whiteboards which tell visitors what we're doing. Prior to the pandemic, this glass door would be slid open for two to three hours a day, allowing staff, volunteers, uh, researchers to interact with the public one-on-one, -on -one, but obviously we've had to curtail that due to the pandemic. When you get to the third floor, behind me is archaeology. To my left is paleontology. So we're going to go behind the glass here now and meet with Kelsey Abrams, who is the fossil prep manager, and she can tell us about that space there. Hi, I'm Kelsey Abrams, and I'm the fossil prep lab manager at the Burke Museum. Um, so our new Burke Museum has a brand new fossil preparation lab, and it's got a lot of updates that the old lab did not have. So if you were, you were never able to see the old prep lab, actually. It was in the basement of the old Burke. It had no windows. It had very poor ventilation. We had rolling ventilation. Now we have big overhead ventilation systems. Um, it was a dark, sad, cramped room, and now we have a nice big space. We've got good ventilation. We have amazing lighting. We've got natural lighting. So it's a whole new space for us to work in, and we're also able to interact with the public. The public is able to see us through two windows in our lab, which is pretty exciting because they get to see the progress of all the projects that we have going on. Projects like our Tufts Love T-Rex skull, which was largely prepared by volunteers in the public eye. Um, we have all sorts of fossils besides just the T-Rex here in the fossil lab, though. We've got dinosaurs from Hill Creek. Obviously, this is a hadrosaur tail, um, some of the vertebrae. This is from Montana. So we do largely work in Hell Creek fossils. But we also have fossils from all around the world, like Africa, Antarctic. This is an African specimen of a Gorgonopsid. We've got a big old canine right there, and that's the eye socket. So we work on big, cool African mammals from the Permian. Um, we work on our T-Rex. We've got our specimens from Antarctica, and it's exciting to see all the different cool things that come through here, besides just Washington crabs and whales. A lot of the work that we do here is on dinosaurs, but we largely specialize in small mammals from the Cretaceous or from um, the Bridger Formation of Wyoming. So this is a tiny mammal skull that I prepared last year. And the work that we do here at the Berg is done almost exclusively underneath microscopes. Archaeology is the last collections and exhibit space we're going to visit on our tour. The galleries are behind me, workspace here to my left. We're going to go behind the glass and meet with collections manager Laura Phillips to share her knowledge of that space with us. Hi, my name is Laura Phillips and I manage the archaeology collections here at the Burke Museum. You're welcome. This is our one of our workrooms. We have two in this new facility. And I think you can see behind me there's this incredible uh, expanse of windows. And in our area, these windows actually are doors and they open up. So on days when we have a lot of people, on the weekends, um, we also have the first three Thursdays, we open that glass door up and we present a little bit about what we're doing and it helps us to engage with the public, which is fabulous for us. So um, even when we are, um, you know, when the public isn't here, we're still doing the work behind the scenes. So what we do when the public's not here is the same as what we do when the public's here. Um, and that has really been um, really great for the public to, to get that inside view. So you can see here, Courtney is rehousing um, a couple of different objects. Um, for a mini interpretation slash exhibit that we do on this side of the glass. Okay, so we're first entering the archives area. Um, and you can see we actually have really high compactor units because we can we are actually the state repository for archaeology field records. So we anticipate expanding pretty rapidly. But you can see the archives. You can, you can just point down here, we'll show you um, just how extensive the archives are. These are field notes, maps, uh, general records for archaeology. Now we're going to go into the collections room. We have um, about 500,000 object records, but of course in archaeology that means many, many more collections. Um, and we have two sort of storage areas that we um, focus on. So we have Delta design cabinets that have materials that are fragile in drawers. And then we also have these extensive garage door opening cabinets where we have uh, 
box footage, which is the bulk of the collections here. We also have, um, I'd say about half of our collections are stored um, at an offsite facility. Uh, but you can see most of the archaeology collections are stored in this way. That concludes our tour today. And I want to thank all of the museum staff and faculty researchers for sharing their time and knowledge and expertise with us. Most importantly, I want to thank our videographer, UW undergraduate student Isaac Epelwein, who did all of the video. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you.